My name is Yehuda Solomon, and um, I'm from Moshav Mevomodi'in in Israel. That's where you were born. I was born in Jerusalem, and then a year after I was born, the Moshav got started. And my parents were one of the first core people to move there by Reb Shlomo Karlibach. Um, it was kind of like an abandoned army base. No one wanted to live there. There was nothing going on in that part of the country. And here was a group of hippies that Shlomo Karlibach just you know, convinced to come to Israel and learn in yeshiva, and they could not be in the city. They were miserable in the city. These are hippies that came from the woods, you know, in Northern California, and they heard that there was this opening to be in nature and not next to the city at all, and they jumped on it, and that's where they've been living ever since, since 1976. Well, how many people were the founders? So the first core was about six couples. My parents were one of them, and then, uh, and then over the years it became more like 40, 45 families. Where are your grandparents from? My grandparents, um, they're fr I mean my parents grew up, both of them grew up in Brooklyn, New York. So their parents were in the States, they're, they're the generation before that, I guess my, my parents' grandparents, sorry, let me backtrack. My grandmother, my mother's mother, is a Holocaust survivor. She came with her mother. She was a young girl, teenager, to New York. And she was raised in, in, in Brooklyn, not religious. She always remembers seeing the people, like the Jews with the black coats and the black jackets. She knew that she was part of that tribe, but she didn't know anything about it. Um, and my father grew up also in a secular home. But they went to synagogue, like they went to shul on high holidays. And he was, he had a good voice, he was in the choir actually for Yom Kippur, so he got to learn a little bit of the, about the prayers, you know. Yeah, I didn't realize until recently that your father was musical. Yeah, my father's very musical. He had a band of his own that was very popular in the, in the 80s called the Diaspora Yeshiva Band. Oh. They toured all over the place, they were, they were like the first a f like really the first Jewish religious rock band that like played klezmer and they played um, bluegrass and you know there was there was nothing like it at the time. What was his concept of blending secular and religious? Um, I mean, he was a music. Um, he got a master's degree from at Berkeley University in, in Northern California, and that's where really the scene was happening when he was going to college. I mean, his roommate was the keyboard player from Country Joe and the Fish and, and uh, all those, you know, the Berkeley Folk Festivals were happening right on campus there, so he was really like in the middle of, of a really happening scene. And uh, he loved classical music and also bluegrass music. He, was, he plays fiddle, mandolin, guitar, banjo, those are like his main instruments. And so when he came to Yeshiva in Jerusalem, he met all these other American Bal Chuvas that were uh, studying in the yeshiva and also musical. Um, but he was the only one that was really like educated in music. Like, he could read and write and, and arrange. So he was arranging all the music and uh, and he brought that bluegrass aspect to the to the like rock stuff. And they were all on fire. They were like you know freshly Bal Chuvas learning in yeshiva. So like the, you know their music was just really like you know coming from the heart and and. Uh, Pretty amazing stuff, actually. How did your parents meet? My parents met in the woods. It's a crazy story. My, my my mother was already there in the in this commune in in the redwood forest near Mendocino County. It's actually called Albion. There's an Albion River there, living completely with no electricity, no running water. And um, after my father finished college, he was kind of just you know wandering around that northern California checking different things out and he happened upon this commune and when he got to the entrance there was like a big uh, board like a bulletin where people post poems or different things recipes for things and uh, he read this poem and when he read the poem he, he he was fell in love with the person that wrote it and he was like oh my god he had this like revelation where like whoever wrote this is my soulmate and I have to meet her <laughs> and uh he asked around, who wrote this? And they were like, oh, it's Diane. She, uh, my Medina now, but 
at the time it was Diane. Um, yeah, she's a great writer, and uh, she's uh, she also plays guitar and sings. Um, and he met her, and yeah, and they fell in love, and and they lived there for a few years. They had my old my, my older brother was born there, my sister, and that was right around the time when my father met uh, heard about Rob Shlomo. He was actually um, he says that one day he had this thing called a Yiddishkeit attack which he was like, I'm Jewish, what does this mean? I need to find out more. I know nothing about my heritage. And he started asking around, I need to find the rabbi. And everyone was like, no rabbi is going to see someone that looks like you. And he kept asking, and finally someone said, you know what, there's this rabbi in San Francisco, and he's perfect for you. He's a musician, and, he, and he, they call him the, the hippie rabbi. And my father blew his mind. And they said it's, he has a center called the House of Love and Prayer which he loved even more, like, oh, far out. So he drove up there in his 1969 Studebaker truck, which was, like, stalling, so he couldn't stop. If he stopped, it would die. So he had to keep revving it all the way, um, you know, on the coast. All the way. He got to San Francisco. He pulled up to the parking lot of the House of Love and Prayer. Car stalled. And some guy came out and gave him a big hug and said, hey, brother, welcome, we've been waiting for you. He's like, really? I, you, maybe you're confusing me with someone else. It's like, no, 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 we're so happy you came. Is there anything we could do for you? Um, and he said, actually, I've been traveling for four hours. I couldn't get out of my car because it would have died. Is there some drink or food or something? And he said, actually, today is a Jewish fast day. So I can't give you actual eating food, but I can give you the best food for your soul. Come with me. And he brought him inside. And Shlomo was just about to start teaching a class in in the courtyard of the... House of Love and Prayer, and he came with a whole list of questions for the rabbi, you know, like, and he just sat down, he figured he'll wait till the end of the class and he'll ask him the questions. And Shlomo was teaching from the biggest book he ever saw in his life, like this huge book, and as he's teaching, he's answering every question he ever had, and he's blowing his mind, and he's wondering why everyone else is there, he's obviously just speaking to him. And, uh, when the class was over, he went over to him and he says, oh my God, what is this book that you're teaching from? And he says, and Shlomo said, what's your name, brother? And he said, he said, Ben Sion. He's like, Psh. he gave him a kiss on his forehead. And he said, this is Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. And uh, my father says that in that moment, he received both of his rabbis. He received Rabbi Nachman, he became a Breslover that second. And he received Rabbi Shlomo, who was his living rabbi. And that's where really the journey started. And after that, they would cut. He went. He went back and told my mother all about it. And he was like, "You have to come meet this rabbi. It's amazing." He he invited us for Shabbos, so they went for Shabbos a few times. And uh, it was you know the rest is history. <laughs> I mean, I could keep telling telling you more. This is like a long story. Uh, how he ended up in Jerusalem and the Moshe and everything. But yeah, how did he end up in Jerusalem? So after coming back and forth to the house of love and prayer at one point my father said okay Shlomo I'm ready to take this to the next level I want to go to yeshiva and really study and um, don't tell me to go back to New York because I don't want to go back to New York where should I go and they walked around the block three times and Shlomo kept stopping and chuckling and thinking and mumbling things and then he finally stopped and looked him straight in the eyes and said Ben Sion you need to go to Yerushalayim and learn Gemara and that sentence has changed his life the way he said it with such conviction, you know, he, it wasn't like Shlomo also didn't tell people like the, what to do. You know, he would suggest, and maybe you should go here, maybe you should think about doing this. He said it like so clear to him that that's what he needed. That my father went, they went back. Aim and him packed up the few things that they had. Uh, they had been living in a treehouse that, that he built, and uh, and they took a flight to to Israel. They didn't think they were going to stay long. They thought maybe they'll go for a couple of years, study, and come back. And they never left. And uh, shortly after that, a year later, the Moshav started, and that's where I grew up. What was life like there, God? Um, so most of the time, it was pretty quiet. At the time when I was growing up, there was no city nearby. Um, there was the closest city was Lud, and it was like a two-lane highway, this old highway, and. You know, every every 40 minutes you would hear, like, a car zipping by the highway. It was really, like, the middle of nowhere. And um, and our parents loved it. They, you know, we grew our own vegetables. And my mother knitted our clothes. 
everything was homemade, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't money, but we didn't feel lack. I don't remember ever thinking we're poor or anything, like, we had everything we needed. Um, it was quiet, and then Shlomo would come to town, and suddenly the place would just come alive, and it would, it would be like a, like a Jewish festival, where like hundreds of people, every type of Jew, would be showing up. Like the word would be out Thursday, Shlomo, it's going to be a, a Shlomo Shabbos. And by Thursday night, cars were driving in and hippies were walking in with backpacks. And you'd have from the most firm Jew, like yeshiva kids or, you know, people with strimals to like the most whacked out hippie tripping on LSD, you know, and people pitching tents everywhere. And it was really, it would become like this happening fun thing you know and it was just the whole weekend of singing and teaching and kids running around it was like a party and then Motsu Shabbos Shlomo would do a big concert Saturday night and more people would drive in from near towns and uh, and I realized years later that Shlomo was doing these concerts and all these things to raise money for his chevra he called them his holy chevra and it just blows my mind how much he dedicated himself to his chaz- to his followers, you know, so that they can be able to survive and and and, and, uh, and thrive in Israel. It just it, it, I recently was reading an article about Sh- Shlomo found out that some people like came in the gate and didn't pay, and he made this little announcement like, "Holy, holy people, you know, I, I really, I do this for my holy chevra. This is their bread and butter, I, you know." And it, it made me cry, like how much he dedicated himself to to, to others, you know. Especially us as Chevra. So I, I, I was so lucky to be able to learn firsthand how to daven from him, you know, when he would when he would lead the davening there and his special nusach that he created with the singing and the and the feeling. Um, I was a little boy standing next to him my whole childhood until I was nineteen, on and off. So um, it was such a gift to be able to, and and we lived next door to him also in the Moshav, so you know, we were always very close. He was always coming into our house to, to you know, to borrow some holy books and to make a cup of coffee, and uh, it's a pretty amazing experience. Were you working in the Moshe? Working? No. I mean, I was mostly my childhood. I was going to school, coming back. Um, I started working. I mean, I got to perform with Shlomo when I was a teenager, and he would actually pay us, which was amazing. Like, you know, just. Just to get on stage with him, you would he'd say he was like the biggest rock star for us, you know. And um, the, he, the fact that he would invite me on stage and he would tell the crowd, he was like, "This is the greatest singer in Israel," and he gave me so much respect and kavod. And um, and then he would hand me like twenty dollars, and then the gig, I was like, "Oh my god, this is the most incredible thing." Um, but then, yeah, then I started creating my own music. You know, I was very influenced by my father and his band and Shlomo. And I grew up listening to all those great records that my parents brought with them because, you know, I tell people we didn't really have any electrical devices in the house except for a record player. And so we would sit for hours and listen to Bob Dylan and Joni Mitchell and Cat Stevens, all that good stuff from, from the 60s, 70s. And it started influencing me to write my own music. So I guess when I was like 16, I started writing my own music and started the band with my brothers. We didn't have a name. We would go up to the university in Jerusalem, Hebrew U, and just sit on the campus and play for the for the students that were there overseas, the American students, because we weren't really Israel. We were Israeli because we grew up in, in Israel, born and raised in Israel, but we were raised in this little American hippie bubble, which everyone there spoke English. So we mostly connected to these students that would come for the year that were English speaking. And they became our fans, and we didn't have a name, and they just called us the Moshav Band, because we were from the Moshav. It's like, it's the Moshav guys, and we started playing clubs in Jerusalem and in Tel Aviv, and kind of built up a following, and then uh, I could go on and on and on, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, there were the two, two students from uh, Montreal who uh, we really connected with, Sig and Justin, and... Um, you know, having us play these concerts and coming to their university, and they came to the Moshav a bunch of times, and it became like the highlight of their of their year in Israel. And they wanted to take that experience to call. They had this idea to to bring that experience to college campuses all over North America. 
So they, um, they found out that year there was um, a big Jewish conference in Israel. It's called um, the, the GA, the General Assembly. It's like this big thing. It happens in a major city every year. It happened to be in Israel, in Jerusalem that year. And they managed to get a, a five-minute meeting with Edgar Bronfman, who's like a multi-millionaire J Canadian Jew who made his money off uh, selling alcohol when it was illegal in Canada. And um, they convinced him that, that they're going to do this thing called the Wake Up Tour, and they're going to bring the Moshav band to college campuses, to Hillel's, and do Shabbatons, and, and do big concerts. And they sold him on it. We didn't even have a, a CD at the time, so they played him. <laughs> they played him Dave Matthews. And they said, this is them. And he was like, wow, they sound great. They played like a half a song of a Dave Matthews song. <laughs> and he wrote a check for $50,000, and that was our first time out of Israel touring. And uh, it was so successful um, that we started getting calls in Israel to come back to colleges and different Jewish centers and stuff. So we decided to uh, maybe come to America and try to get our music out there because it was there was so much more opportunity here than in, in Israel. It was a very small market. And that's how I got stuck here, you know. You, you heard the story of how I ended up in L.A. for my wife already, but um, I never left because, I, the, like, like I said, the, you know, we, would just, we got really busy and we realized that our music can spread a lot, you know, reach larger audiences out here. And we, thank God we've been able to fly all over the world and meet amazing people and perform our, our own original music combined with Rip Shlomo's music, which we grew up on. So it's been a, such a blessing and a dream come true for me to be able to do what I love and make a living doing it, you know. So let's quickly talk about Happy Minion. Happy Minion, yeah. So that was really the... That's where the seed was planted, like, of coming to the States because, I, like my wife said, I was walking down on my way to a... I was on my way to a gig and I feel a tap on my shoulder and... This guy says, hey, I'm Stewie Wax, which I heard his name. I heard about the Happy Minion because I had a friend out here, Shlomo Katz, who was living here. So I knew about a little bit about it. I didn't know much. And he was like, hey, we're looking for uh, someone to lead the High Holidays. We're a Carly Bach Minion. I know that you're like the Carly Bach Hazan. Can we fly you out? And uh, my wife was just about to go back to college at NYU. So I was like, is that close to New York? And he's like, well, it's, you know, it's in America. It's not... It's closer than here. I said, okay, great. You know, I'll be able to see my, my girlfriend at the time. Um, let's do it. And I came out here and I fell in love with the community. It's just such an amazing group of people that just really want to come and pray and connect in, in a way of joy and non-judgment. And, and then they flew me back for a couple years because everyone, you know, it, it just was a perfect fit. Um... And after that, I got the idea of, you know what, it would be an easy transition to come to L.A. There's a lot of people in the industry there, and I started meeting people in the industry. And that's how I first ended up at the Happy Minion. And it's been my honor to, you know, to lead the prayers here for about 20 years. Talk about the, when the melodies come to you and out of your mouth. The, the melodies of the prayer or, the, or when I'm writing songs? Of uh, prayer, davening. Oh, the davening. And yeah. Sometimes you don't, you don't consciously choose a melody for, for a certain. Yeah, it's yeah. For me, it's kind of like just it's all in there, you know, from my whole childhood. So yeah, I don't like write a set list. I don't, you know, I don't come to shul like thinking oh, tonight I'm going to sing this for this. It kind of just happens. Like I, I'm, I feel it. And because these songs are such, like, they're kind of like the soundtrack of my life, that it just naturally flows into the words. Uh, it's pretty amazing when I think, I don't even think about this, but when I, now that I'm saying it out loud, they're so embedded in me, in my bones, you know? That it just, when I start praying, the, the melodies just kind of pour over onto the words. Yeah. And it's an amazing thing. And then to have people that, that just... <laughs> are there to like join and, and, and are so ready to do that like 
it's my favorite minion in the world because I, I travel around a lot all over the world and I, I go to other shuls and I, I literally get depressed. And even when I'm leading, they'll ask me to lead a Karla Bach service, but like two people are singing, you know, the people are just getting bugged out and looking at their watch and the rabbi's getting nervous, he's doing this to me. You know? mm. I'm like, guys, what are we doing, you know? <laughs> and it's going through the motions and, and not to knock other people, but I just... When I come to shul, it's it's a, it's a, an opportunity to just connect to, to connect to the, to Hashem and, and pour your heart out and and to do it with song and prayer and with people that want to do it that way that, that that's why they come. It's the greatest thing, you know. It's not about how you wear the tallest or if the chazan's wearing sneakers or not or if you're wearing if he's wearing a jacket like I go to certain shows they're like oh you have to wear a jacket you, you can't get up there without a jacket and you have to have the tallest over your head it's like all these technicalities like you know let's pray let's you know like, what about the actual praying let's talk about that <laughs> what is it about Karl Bach melodies that are so effective he, you know, he said about his own melodies. He said that before his he he was sent down to this earth, he said, "Can you just give me two minutes?" And he ran into the holy of holies and grabbed as much melodies as he could and stuffed them into his pocket, into his pocket, and 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 came down. And I really believe that. I think the, that these melodies are melodies that were sung by the Levites in the temple. They're so simple, but they. They have tears, and they have, they they just crack your your heart open, you know. And when your heart is open, it's able to seep in, you know. When it's closed and tight, it just it won't go in. But when you're when they they have these melodies have a way of, of breaking your heart a little bit, and then when there's a crack, that's where the that's where it just goes in, and and you feel it the most. What do you say is the mission statement of the Happy Minion now? To be able to offer this kind of davening, you know, this this to offer a space where anyone can come in at whatever state that they're in in their life and not feel judged, first of all, because that's like the, to feel accepted. You know, you walk in and you get a hug, and to create a, a an environment where you're you're comfortable to just open up, be vulnerable, and connect. Hashem and and really feel it you know I think that's for me anyway that's like the number one thing you know and I, and I, and I feel it the most when I'm at the happy menu there are other places where I feel it um, but I really feel it the most here I'm the most comfortable I've been to the white show the white show no I haven't heard of that far off away Five towns. Five towns? No. Eight cats. Oh wow. Yeah, I know Eight cats. He he grew up here also. I used to, right. when I first moved to LA, he was a little boy. We actually wrote some songs together, uh, recorded with him. Um, no, I haven't been to there. I I mostly go to uh, Pomona. There's a really strong Carly Bach. Um, s- couple different shoes there that that love the davening. And also over there, that's the closest, I think, that I felt where you can have lots of different types of Jews just there to sing and connect, and uh, I love it when I go there. Yeah, I mean, for us, growing up on the Moshav, like I said, we were in this American hippie bubble in Israel, so I felt like when we left the Moshav, we were back in Israel almost, even though, you know, obviously it's Israel, and it was an amazing place to grow up on. Um... But so we grew up on that music that our parents brought, and then when you would leave the moshav, you were in it. You you know you were exposed to all this other Middle Eastern, so many types of Jews in Israel, Ethiopians, you know, Yemenites, Moroccan. So in high school, I loved um, hanging out with the Yemenite kids, and when they would sing these ancient Jewish Yemenite songs, like we sing the song called Abba Shimon, and uh, that whole Eastern sound was just so. Yeah, beautiful. So we oh, we're always blending that in. There's a lot of Middle Eastern kind of themes and rhythms in our in our music. So yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like a pita. You throw in all kind of a lot of different things. You add some spice, and you get like a Moshav song. You know, 
<laughs> uh, how do you choose the keys for your songs? The keys. For me, I just try to think of the, you know, I take the high part of the song, and if I'm comfortable on the high part, I take it from there. In general, also in shul, when I start in Higan, I always, in my head, I envision the high part first. Because a lot of times, it's so important to be able to sing a, a song in a key that the rest of the community could could sing it. Otherwise, you start it too high, you killed it. So, I always try to think of the highest part of the song, and then take it from there. Besides for the vocal range, don't keys have other implications, like about a subconscious mood or something like that? Yeah, yeah, there's the major and the minor, and and things um, I don't know I think I just try to find the key that I'm most comfortable to sing it in it's like I don't put too much thought into it yeah what's for what's in stock for the future of Moshav for the future right now we're working on another album of uh, originals we did two Shabbat albums we felt like we really dove into our childhood and bring that out and it, it's been amazing people love it it's sold like you know more more than a lot of our other albums um, but I think now it's time to, again, you know, do another original album. Um, and, yeah, maybe, you know, the Moshav just went through something tragic where the whole place burnt down in, in fires and everyone's been displaced. So there's going to be some themes, you know, of, of displacement and fire. and Which, anyway, a lot of our songs, for some reason, we were like, after the fire, we were like, whoa, so many of our songs talk about fire you know the whole world's on fire uh, I, I can't think right now but there's we have a song called Misplaced we have a bunch of different songs that, that kind of already talk about this process you know that, that the Moshav is going through right now so I guess it'll be more of that you know with obviously new fresh things that we're always always trying to bring something new in were your father's original records there? Everything was burnt. Yeah, I mean, his whole—he lost his. He had a studio there, mm-hmm. and uh, all of the instruments, all of the backups of the his life's work, was all consumed in the fire. It's heartbreaking. 